More Chumba Casino fan mail. Love this. It says, Dear Ryan, I love Chumba Casino. They're so much fun. I love the wild ride from the social slots to the slingo to jackpots quicker than a six-time real spin. Everybody's finding their fun at Chumba Casino. Why don't you find out for yourself? Head to ChumbaCasino.com and enjoy hundreds of casino-style games for free with your welcome bonus. Sponsored by Chumba Casino. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. Hello and welcome to the Byline Podcast with me, Adrian Goldberg, covering the US election from Washington, D.C. Please forgive the hoarse voice, if you will. I'm recording this while the outcome of the poll, Harris versus Trump, is still unknown. And the question on everyone's lips here is, will the results be respected, especially by Donald Trump and his supporters, if Kamala Harris wins? Trump does have form in this area, of course. He recently said that he shouldn't have left the White House in December 2020 after losing an election whose outcome he still disputes. After a rally he gave on the lawn in front of the White House, known as the Ellipse, on January the 6th, 2021, thousands of his supporters stormed the US Capitol building. Some armed only with their iPhones, but others wielding sticks and pepper spray. All part of Trump's plan, according to an independent, bipartisan congressional committee, to get the election result overturned. The process of undermining the election result had begun months before. And on the day itself, January the 6th, Trump ignored pleas to send his supporters home for more than three hours. Five people died in the attack, or in its immediate aftermath. 174 police officers were assaulted. Four were reported to have taken their own lives in the months following the assault on the Capitol. Hundreds of those involved have been jailed, some for seditious conspiracy, others for relatively minor offences like obstruction. We thank you so much for allowing us to gather each and every night on this corner to be a voice for the voiceless and for you, Lord. We ask all of this in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. I've come now to Washington's Central Detention Facility, otherwise known as DC Jail, a grim, forbidding grey high-rise where there's a nightly vigil offering support to prisoners jailed for their role in the January the 6th attack. Amongst their supporters are the mum of Ashley Babbitt. Ashley was a former member of the US Air Force and a Trump supporter who was killed during the insurrection. Ashley's mum decides that she will do an interview with me, then decides that she doesn't want to do it after all, which of course is her prerogative. So instead, I talked to Brandon Fellows. Brandon was jailed for three years after being described as a cheerleader for the January the 6th insurrection. But why had he gone to a Trump rally in the first place? There's multiple reasons why I came down. One, I've always wanted to see Trump. I felt like this might be his last one. I was at sort of like the legal standard in America, which is called a preponderance of the evidence that the election was stolen, so 51% chance or greater. I wasn't certain. Um, but I had felt it was, and I wanted it to be looked into, at least, you know, for them to say, hey, we're going to look into this. And aside from that, I also had heard and seen at the two previous rallies down here, the Stop the Steal rallies that began in November and happened also in December, Antifa had been attacking Trump supporters. I came down here to defend against that, especially when Trump said it was going to be wild, and I saw that on Facebook. I said, oh, I think they're going to want some revenge. So um, those are the main reasons I came down. And also, I was... I was really in support of Trump, you know, because he was trying to make a stand, especially in comparison to Biden, to the unconstitutional, unscientific lockdowns that they had been implementing during COVID. I did not want that. I did not like them telling me how to operate my business. They can go screw themselves. So, yeah. What, what is your business? I had a tree company and a chimney company in upstate New York. So I think that was, and Trump advocated for that. You know, none of this forced lockdown stuff. Let the people decide what they want to do. It's worth pointing out at this stage that lockdown decisions were taken at state and not federal level. Although in March 2020, 
Donald Trump did tell Americans to avoid gatherings of more than 10 people and to stop eating at restaurants. Within a month, he was tweeting his support for those who were ignoring social distancing guidelines. Covid caused more than 1.1 million deaths in the United States, the highest recorded total of any country in the world. My conversation with Brandon then turns to Russia. The report by Special Counsel Robert Mueller for the United States Justice Department in 2019 concluded that Russia had systematically attempted to illegally interfere in the 2016 presidential election. It identified links between Trump associates and Russian officials and said that Russian interference was welcomed by the Trump camp. And then, of course, there's Trump's personal admiration for Vladimir Putin. I think he respects him as a leader, just like, for instance, you know, if I were to respect somebody that, uh, you know, like say I'm a wrestler, you know, I was a wrestler. Say there's a person, right, on my opposing team. This is a kind of, you know, it's very different, but also you can kind of see where I'm going with it. Say the opposing high school has a really good wrestler. You know, I don't like his personality, maybe I don't like the school but I can respect that he's a really good wrestler. I think he respects that Putin leads his people relatively well. And I'd rather get along with people like Putin than, you know, be unnecessarily causing issues with people who have that many nukes. And I prefer not to be in wars. You know, where people are losing their lives over there because of weak leadership over in Ukraine and Russia. And it looks like it might spill over to other countries. Who knows? We move now onto the events of January the 6th itself. And perhaps Brandon's most chilling testimony. You'll hear reference here to Dominic Pozzola. He was a member of the Proud Boys gang, jailed for 10 years for his role in January the 6th. Brandon told me how events unfolded. I didn't even know where the ellipse was. It wasn't until I arrived at 12 o'clock at night on the night of January 6th, I was pretty early, um, and noticed, hey, wait, is that the White House? So I thought that was cool. Then mid, mid speech, she says, we're going to go mar- peacefully and patriotically go march down to the Capitol to let our voices be heard. Storm. Trump said Trump that. Said that yeah. yeah. Um, and I was in the VIP section. I was actually the first civilian allowed in. I went through, I have a video of it on my X page. So out of all the people there, I was the first civilian allowed into the ellipse. So when that ended, I go down, it's a slow march. You know, you see the uh, different groups. You're like checking them out as you go walk down Pennsylvania and or Constitution. And by the time I got down there, I just see people climbing up the stairs, but there's so many people. It's on the northwest side that I approached. And there's so many people though that not enough people are getting up the stairs. And you know, I was thinking maybe somebody might fall. And they got this huge balustrade, you know, balustrade, like a giant railing. And so I see people climbing up and helping people up there to try to, it looks like, relieve some of the pressure of uh, all the people trying to get in on these stairs. So I jump up there and I'm helping people climb up there as well until some crazy guy with a, with a microphone shouts, pull him off, yank him. And I looked at him and I said, pull And he's looking at me. And they were claiming I was in the way. And I was like, well, this is like a big drop. I'm not getting pushed off. So I moved up further. So then I get up next to uh, what is called the uh, parliamentary door, which is again, still Northwest side. And people are just kind of standing around there. People are chanting USA. And then somebody on a loudspeaker shouted, Mike Pence certified the election, which now I know is a lie. You know, he didn't certify it until much later. But whether you're a Democrat or Republican, both sides knew that if he did that, that means it's over. He's tie-breaking it. And so that caused a couple people to freak out. They broke a window. Now, there was already that broken door that Dominic Bazola had broken out earlier, but they had apparently secured it. I didn't see that yet. But this old man with a cane starts hitting it. I get surprised, and I'm recording it. I'm like, oh, this guy's not going to break into what I imagine was the most, world's most secure building. And about, like, three hits, and it's open. I said, well, good luck opening the door, you know, like... To my, you know, I'm saying that on the video, like, good luck opening the door. He's not gonna, but it opens up mid-sentence. And he just walks right, you know, he's, he's, he goes right in. Now, I saw a police swat at him with a baton. And I said, all right, mental note taken. They don't want us in there. So, about five, ten minutes later, I hear a different chant coming from this other side. Um, it was actually where originally where Dominic Pozzola had gone in. You know, the, the first break-in with a riot shield. Um, which was at 2, I think it was like 2.12 p.m. So this is around 2.49 p.m. I'm approaching this window. So about 45 minutes later. And so they're chanting, the, they're letting us in, they're letting us in. Some people just charge right in after hearing that. But I walked over and I observed the police officers and I saw them going like this, waving. 
waving at people to go further into the building. So you saw police officers encouraging people into the building? Yes, yes. Yeah. And so that sounded crazy at the time. But now, you know, we have that the watch commander, uh, as early as 2.40, what was it, 2.47 p.m., he had been giving orders, the watch commander of the Capitol Police, to only focus on people that were breaking things or attacking police officers. So they're not focusing on trespassers or people that are being disorderly. So that lines up with what they were doing. They had been given the orders to only focus on that. So people like me that are just walking in, taking selfies, they were being told, hey, we're not, yeah, you're, you're fine. Just don't do this, don't do that. So I go down and I see this office open and I go inside, I'd go to charge my phone. My phone's dead, I wanted to record. I was like, I don't know what's happening. I didn't know if there was an overthrow happening and the police were siding with us. I didn't know if this was just allowed because it's called the people's house, but it kind of, at once I talked to an officer inside, it kind of quickly became, okay, this just is, seems to be some random thing. Maybe they're supportive, but we have a 6 p.m. curfew. So we got to follow the 6 p.m. curfew. Who, who imposed that curfew? Uh, Mayor Bowser of D.C. So uh, that had been sent out, and uh, they said, yep, just you guys got to follow the 6 p.m. curfew. And so but it was interesting because later on outside, they started kicking people off around 4.30 off the upper grounds. So I think they wanted it completely. The ground's clear by 6. But either way, I had left right around then anyways. But yeah, because I thought I was allowed inside the building, the second I left, I was caught. And I talked on live television to CNN and said, my name is Brandon Fellows from Albany, New York, because I thought I was allowed in. You know, no reason to hide. And uh, I said, the police were really cool. It seemed like they were on our side. We were smoking a bunch of weed in there, and and, uh, and yeah, so, yep. My life was going great. I, I did not want to ruin my life. I was kind of, um, you know, cowardly in the fact that, hey, I don't think Biden should be in office. I'm I'm supportive of an overthrow, but as what I was observing didn't look like an overthrow. I had left it as an option, but what I was seeing was selfies, people smoking weed, cops just going like this, and I didn't know if they were just like, yeah, like, hey, these people said to fund us for the past few years, these Congress members, like, yeah, let, you know, enjoy your house. It's the people's house. People are chanting our house. There's no other building in the entire country that is called the people's house. And so people are saying, you know, people like me that are confused, we're like, other people are saying, no, no, it's our house. We're allowed inside there. Um, I mean, I suppose I would challenge you there and say there is no parliament building in the world where you could approach it with thousands of people, some of them armed, and expect to meet with no resistance and expect in the aftermath of a contested election, having been to a meeting at which one of the rivals in that contest was arguing that the result was an unfair one. I just can't imagine in what world you would think you could then go as a large group to that parliament building mm -hmm. and not expect some pushback from the state. Got a beautiful document here in America called the Declaration of Independence. And it says the American people have a right and a duty to overthrow a tyrannical government. And it doesn't matter what that government, if they say, hey, we have an issue with it. So that has always been on my and many other people's minds that we have a right and a duty to do that, which honestly... Even Biden if Biden hadn't in implemented a, a tyrannical government, he'd only just been elected. Well, they were talking about packing the Supreme Courts, you know, and a lot of people believe that it was stolen. It should at least be looked into. I think the, the second that they tried telling people they can't work and they started chasing people down to the beaches, I want, you know, I, I was like, I would be supportive of an overthrow at that point. You can't tell us we can't work over this. Maybe if it was something more serious, but you guys are killing people with your reactions. So going back to lockdown, yeah? That's what you're talking about there. Yes, yes. Yeah. But what I'm, what I'm also saying, though, is because America is unique and unlike any other country, we have a document, the founding document that formed all our laws following it, the Constitution and every other law, state law and federal, it was built upon we have a right and a duty to overthrow the government. Now, again, though, just because but, but I saw it... only if it's tyrannical, as I say, this was a, a government which hadn't even... Yeah. started its time in office yet. How, it couldn't be tyrannical until it had taken office. Well, when they're talking about packing the Supreme Courts, mandatory lockdowns, that stuff is, is definitely, I view that as tyrannical. And not to mention, you know, these are the same people that were targeting Trump over these uh, false Russia collusion things. It's subjective. I know to some people they'd say, hey, this is not tyrannical and or, hey, we didn't get to see it, but we, we were hearing what they were talking about at that point. So here we are on the eve of an election, yes. which is expected to be a very close one. If it is a very close election and Trump is the loser, do you expect there to be 
another January the 6th. Do you expect it to be some kind of protest? My feelings have evolved the past four years after the way the, the Democrat, you know, I, I guess I would call it the Democrat Party, the Democrat regime, treated me and others, uh, others and myself. And I'm at the position now where even if he did lose and there was no argument against it, I don't care. I want an overthrow. <laughs> I don't care how that sounds. I've been very vocal about that. I told my jurors, you know, I wanted it right then and there. Um, like, as of, like, while I was in jail. You know, I didn't care. I said, hey, I'm facing 20 years. January 6th, I look at it as a beautiful day now. Um, and I just hope the American people will, you know, muster up the courage and strength, because I know we're very comfortable now. But, you know, but isn't that really frightening talk in a country which stands for liberty and for democracy? I think most intelligent people would accept that no democracy is perfect, that mm. it, it's a flawed but beautiful thing. And you're saying that you will refuse to accept the outcome. Well, I like the what we really are as a constitutional republic. I like referring to it as, as what we are. We're not a democracy, but... Um, you don't think the U.S. is a democracy? Well, no, we're a constitutional republic. What's yeah. the difference? So a constitutional republic, we have a constitution in place, and even if the masses disagree with what's in that constitution, it should not be thrown away. Just because, for instance, right, say the Second Amendment, right? They say, oh, now we feel as if guns should be taken away. It doesn't matter if the masses believe that they should be taken away. We have a constitution in there. Now, we can vote on other things so long as it doesn't throw away our constitution. We vote as a republic with the constitution being respected. But... Of course, the Constitution can be amended, can't it? You're talking about the, the constitutional rights to bear arms. But if, democratically, people agree that the right to bear arms should be restricted or even curtailed altogether, don't you accept that, the, that that is the democratic right of a nation? If we didn't go with numbers, so for instance, in Hillary Clinton, I believe she won the popular vote, right? So in a democracy, she would have won it. But because of the way that our constitutional republic is set up and the... the Confusing, but I'm happy with them. You know, ways that they set it up. Trump won. You know, even though he, to my memory, lost the popular vote. That's right. And so, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. in the democracy, yeah. that would have gone to Clinton. So, you know, that's kind of what... I know there's, like, very big similarities, but, you know, in other ways, uh, there's also some differences. So... Well, surely you have to respect the rights of your fellow citizens. I think a lot more lives will be saved doing an overthrow and putting, for instance, if he would accept it, putting Trump in office um, if he were to lose. I don't think he would. And if he did, I don't think it would be accurate. But if he did, right, either way, whether it's true or not, I think a lot more lives would be saved by doing a quick overthrow and putting Trump in. Because, for instance, I think less people would have died in the world and country if an actual insurrection had uh, taken place on January 6, 2021, because I don't think the war in Ukraine would have happened. I don't think Israel would be in the state that it's dealing with Lebanon and uh, the Gaza Strip and the surrounding areas that potentially are about to go off. I don't think that we'd have the border crisis or the fentanyl overdoses that we'd have. I'm not saying that would all disappear, but I think that a lot of people do not take Biden seriously, and a lot of people have been taking advantage of him, whether it's the border, whether it's Russia, whether it's you know the other countries of the world, and I think it's causing a lot of death both in this country and outside of it. So I think, just like the, real quick, just like the Civil War was beneficial for the country, even though we lost more lives in America than ever before, I think in the long run, it was very beneficial for us to have. It's sad that we lost so many lives back then, but it was beneficial for our country, in my opinion. So final question then. You believe in an overthrow, and would you therefore argue that having Trump, if he would accept the role as the ruler of the country. If they were to steal it, I'd prefer for Trump to take office in that way, whether you want to call it a sort of king or dictatorship, whatever you want to call it. I look to George Washington. George Washington, our first president, had so much power and they were afraid, right? The, a, a lot of people in the government were afraid that he was going to make himself a sort of king, you know, King George of America. But he had the character to say, hey, no, we're going to run with the idea of America and we're going to implement what we were originally setting out to do. And he gave that power up, which is a pretty big moment. Now, obviously, that takes a lot of trust and it's a pretty dangerous position. But our founding fathers even said about every 250 years, you may have to, you know, the tree of liberty. I think it was Benjamin Franklin said the tree of liberty may have to be purged with the blood of the patriots and the tyrants. And I think, you know, it's very corrupt right now. They need to be cleaned out. A lot of these government institutions, whether that's firing or whatever. 
you know. But and the logic of your position then is that you would like to see Trump as an absolute ruler, not subject to normal traditional democratic control. If we can't cleanse out the system from a lot of the corrupt people and agencies like the Department of Justice, it needs at least an attempt to be made. If we can't do that through the normal process, I would prefer that, but that doesn't mean I want it to last. I'd want it to be just like George Washington. He gets in, takes over for what is necessary to be able to do what's, you know, do what's good for the country and then give that power back up right back on the way that America used to you know, elect presidents, not to hold that position indefinitely. Because America is great and it was the greatest country. It is still, though it's dying, it's the greatest country that the world has seen. The trouble is with dictators though, is that if, or rulers, is that you can't make them give up power, can you? History suggests that people who have absolute power are very rarely likely to give it back. Usually they hog it or give it to their kids. True, but I think we saw, I think Trump had a right to not give it up when it was at least questionable that it had been taken from him. You know, this past election, and he still did. They said he wouldn't leave office. He did. So I think that's a good sign that, you know, and I think he's been extremely humbled, or so it appears so, after his assassination attempts. Um, So I know it involves a level of trust. But again, I think this is all just very, very low, low chance of happening. I think Trump is going to win, and it's very scary saying that on the eve, but um, I don't think, and even though that's my wishes, I just don't think all that would happen. I don't think the American people are uncomfortable enough, which I think they should be, to do it. And I'm speaking out of experience because despite all that the government's done to me, am I willing to grab a gun and go shoot up some place, you know, shoot up, the, shoot up at the Capitol? No. But I think an overthrow should happen. But I'm still too comfortable to do things like that. I think our founding fathers just... I mean, they were very brave and or (laughs) did not have a lot to lose, but we live in a society of comfort. And it's unfortunate because, you know, I kind of feel like we're a frog being slow boiled. So that's Brandon Fellows, who has served time in this grim prison behind me. He told me that during his two years inside, he wasn't allowed any fruit or vegetables. He said he developed scurvy like a pirate and didn't feel that he was particularly well treated. I have sympathy for him in that sense, but I also am chilled by what I'm hearing from him. The idea that he supports an overthrow of democratic rule in the United States, that maybe every 250 years or so, that there is a need to purge the country, there is a need to prune the tree of liberty. I just find it really shocking in this day and age that somebody who has served time for taking part in the January 6th insurrection. He's not only unapologetic for his role in it, but is still a believer in the ideals that drove him to involvement on that particular day. I I just find it horrifying, really. Well, that was my reaction just a few hours ago to my conversation with Brandon Fellows, but I do thank him for taking the time to explain his point of view to me, which I hope shed light on how at least some Trump supporters are thinking. I'm Adrian Goldberg, and if you want to support our work out here in Washington covering the US election and support our work more generally on this podcast, then do consider taking out a subscription to the Byline Times. It's our brilliant monthly newspaper, and in it you'll find the best of our online articles with content that you can't read anywhere else. Do head over to bylinetimes.com for details of how to become a subscriber. Thanks for listening. I'll see you again very soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye. My Lord.